what strikes me and struck me straight away about being asked to talk about Sierra Leone was the way we in the media um, dash on to the next conflict. You know, we're all thinking about Libya. I walk past all those demonstrators down the road now. Something else is going on the world. We tend to forget too easily, it seems to me. And I think to, tonight we just draw ourselves back a little and remember a country that's had a lot of problems, still has a lot. And Mohammed here is going to, I hope, <laughs> fill us in, tell us a bit more about it. Mohammed, do you think we can your voice up to shouting at the back of the room? Sure. sure. Can you yeah. hear it? Yeah. 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 Good. Okay. Right. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to chat to Mohammed just for a few moments, get a, a, a little bit out of him, and then at the end of it, you know, please do um, some sort of pitch in as well with your with your own <coughs> questions. Oh, and by the way, Jerry, get Millioni. Excellent. Good. Yeah. 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 Well, I was pleased hearing him from Bolzano. I am Bolzano. That's where you've got that Bertzi, the, um, the, the oldest rep man in the world. Anybody know about that? Go to Bolzano, Greg. We're getting a lot of plugs in here tonight, aren't we? Right, okay, here we go. Uh, Mohammed, just tell us, first of all, you are the executive director, the country director in Sierra Leone for Action Aid. You were at university yourself in 1991, and then disaster, war came. What happened to you? Thank you very much, Wes. My case is very serious because I went to college when it was started. I went to college in 91, we hope that I'll round up in 95, and my college was in the south of the country, not too far from where we was started. And we didn't take it serious, but by 1994, we walked up to the college. And so we had to shut down the college for a year. With nothing to do, I had to migrate to Guinea with my own relatives. You went to, to Guinea? Yes. yes, like many other thousands of Australians did move. But luckily for me, because I had some level of education, I was able to survive while I was in Guinea, basically teaching some English to French people who want to study some English. Now they have an opportunity to see a lot of English-speaking people around them. So I took opportunities for that, and I had some things to survive on. But the war had a terrible impact on your country, not just people like you. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, it's so unimaginable. Because this war started, I mean, the, the war had, some of us saw it coming. We actually saw it coming in the sense that we are, that was the time in Sierra Leone where people say if war doesn't come to this country, this country will not change. Because I still remember when I was growing up, things were okay, the roads were alright, we had telephones in our houses, landlines. The roads were tired, schools were very interesting to attend, fun, they give us biscuits and stuff when we go for match pass. After some time, everything was just deteriorating. It was deteriorating, the roads were not repaired, the civil service was dropping. If you had a case in the police, you had to provide the paper on which they had to write the issue. Politics was just a one party system. There was no election set up. It took me 25 years of my life before I took part in the first election in Sierra Leone. That was in 1996. Right. So, anyway, the war came along. The country was obviously in chaos after it. Devastated. And you eventually talked for a while and maybe came to England and did all sorts of things. But you started with Action Aid when? 2004. 2004. Right, so you've been to seven, seven years. Seven years. Now, we've seen the video, we've heard, heard from Jerry and so on. J just describe to us what the need for education is. Give, give us just a few numbers to make the point. Okay, thank you very much. If you see the scenario for Sierra Leone, when the war just ended in 2001, we had like an enrollment of about 600,000 or so children at primary school level. But then the government then introduced free education, so by 2004 to 5, that number had risen to about 1.3 million. Even before the war, the facilities were not enough, and the war came and just destroyed that. So even though we had more children now in school, the facilities were still very, very inadequate. Okay, so we have that kind of large number of children. This is the government up to today has picked that depends on donors for 40% of its income to finance its own budget. And since we are just coming out, during the war, most of the financing was just waiting for the, the war and war and war and nothing on education. That is why education suffered a lot. As recent as two years ago, there was a research which UNICEF that proved that 300,000 children of school going age are still out of school in Sierra Leone. Three, just get that figure right. 300,000 children who should be at school are out of school. Are not in school. And some of the reasons that I gave one has to do with access to education. 
one of which has to do with the distance. You may have, so a lot of communities try to establish their own little school, which did not have much facilities, but probably just primary school level. And if they have to move to another community for junior school, that's the end of the school. Those that could not afford to let their kids move the distance of four or five kilometers to access education where it existed are all dropped out. The reasons where they dropped out, access, early marriage, I mean, violence against girls, those are also issues. You, you said to me earlier, you gave me some figures for literacy levels in the country. Just repeat them for boys and for girls, for men and women. As of December 2009, the MDG report for Sierra Leone puts literacy at 49% for men and 29% for women. So there is an enormous education gap. gap. Big gap between men and women. And the women aspect has to do with the tradition, the culture of keeping girls out of school. And probably because they had to travel some distance to access, it's easier to allow the boys to brave it and to keep the girls at home. One question I must ask you. Uh, Sierra Leone was one of these awful wars where there were child soldiers. You've dealt with child soldiers who've had to try to help them when they came a into schooling? A lot. Just after the war, in Sierra Leone, we launched a project we call Never Again. It's a project that actually, I mean, because the war stole about 11 to 12 years of children's youthful age, a lot of children and youths were in the war. So the campaign was like, never again, never again should these kids be allowed to be used to fight the war. And part of that project had to do with giving these youths now, children who have now grown into youths, another alternative of life. What we did was directly working with them, had to do some negotiation with some formal institutions, to even scale down the entry requirement to design special programs for them where they have been trained. They learn those skills, and after they are trained, we support them with physical money, and we support them with tools to establish their own business on their own. So there are child soldiers who got all the way from being given a gun to kill people to actually being able to live. Transform their schools and useful lives. And as September last year, we took one such to Athens to meet the supporters. There, yeah, one such who has transformed. There is a training center where he does carpentry. He's not married, has two kids, Completely set to learn as a normal Right, let's just go back. 300,000 children should be in school and are not in school. This is, a, this is a wonderful project, but can you be optimistic about what can be done in Sierra Leone? Sure, I think a lot can be done if we do not just wait for government. Mm -hmm. Governments have their politics, have their own issues, but with one school, as I tell you, there is the possibility that you can support four to five hundred children to have access to the future. Even on a project, in one school, because the standard we are working now is a six classroom, structure with an office and a store and has all the basic amenities. Okay, and the one interesting thing I don't want why we think actually this program are different from others, we don't just build the schools and it stops there. Yeah. When we build the schools, we form the social structure that is like the school management committees. We train them to be able to engage government to support the school. We train them so that government, they can put government to account to bring train and qualify teachers in the school. And we form even what we'll beyond sometimes form what we call mothers' club. These are mothers within the communities who take upon themselves responsibility because we train them and tell them about the benefits of education and they tax themselves to work house to house to ensure that all the girls in the community are attending the school, we are at the school. And they monitor the performance of the teachers. So they go to the schools. And the way we try to maybe keep them together, we give them some grants and they will engage in some petty training, some gardening. So if there is a child who cannot go to school because of basic materials, the mothers in that club can provide the basic needs for the to go to school. That is the wonderful change that this Milani project will bring that is completely different from what government is doing. Government, we are it will scale both schools and that's it. But 20 schools to have 10,000 children is a very wonderful opportunity that if those kids get, it's like we are just helping to form a new Sierra Leone. For those kids to become productive citizens in the future and they can help to change the situation. Lack of education, I mean, failing governance was the reason why we had the war in Sierra Leone. Why the government didn't care what people felt about them. There was no election to vote for who you want to. Just one party. If you are not in the government, you are this. So that kind of dis and franchise when people didn't feel they had anything to contribute was to why people decided to take up arms. And to change that, it takes a long time. We believe education could be the best route when those kids see themselves having an opportunity in life. 
as a result of education. As he has some of those kids telling me they would like to become lawyers and doctors. The lawyers and the doctors didn't suffer during the war. They moved out of the country, they moved, they, they moved to other places, and they had a better living than those that never had education. So everybody is conscious about the value of education. Mohammed, I think you've been very, very clear. Mm -hmm. yeah. Show your appreciation. Yeah.